We had rain at our house when I left this morning, but the further I came this way, the, the rain went away. But it's been a welcome relief uh, from some really crazy uh, weather this week. But it was August, and so we're almost turning the page to September. And we've turned the page into the New Testament. And I hope you guys that are following along with us in the F260 uh, enjoyed your reading this week. Lots of things as we get into the Gospels. Uh, this is a lot of rich, rich meat. And so uh, we were really praying over where to go because we had to break uh, one message into two parts. And so uh, the, we started looking at one, and then God moved us here. And so here we are uh, this week, and we're coming up to uh, uh, Luke chapter 15. Uh, and you should have read through this this week, I believe. And, and uh, so if you uh, were looking at the parable of the prodigal son, that's where we're going to be at uh, this morning. It's a very familiar uh, passage. And here's the thing about the F-260 plan, and this is what you've discovered if you've done it for a few years. Uh, as you read through uh, the Word, this is, the, this is what you have to understand about the Bible. And, and, and maybe you're a new Christian, maybe you're an, uh, just, just trying to check this whole thing out. But, but this is why we call this... The living word, okay? That's why we call it the living word. And it can be an electronic format. It can be in a book format. It can be on your phone. It doesn't matter how you read it. It doesn't matter how you hold it or how you, how you experience it because it's his living word. And so when, when, you, when you put that into your heart, when you put that into your mind, uh, God speaks to you through his living word. And, and you'll be surprised and amazed uh, at how differently sometimes I, I thought I knew everything there was to know about the story of the prodigal son. I've preached it. I've read it. I've gone through. I've read books on it. Uh, all the and and every time I go through this, something new, something more, something deeper, a, a deeper truth, a deeper that. And, and sometimes it's been there all along, but it's where I'm at in life today, or where you may be in life today, and it and it, it and it emerges, and it's like this is where you are right now, isn't it? And so that's the really great thing about God's Word is it never, it never gets old. It's always fresh. And, and so this morning, we're going to explore this is probably the most familiar parables that we, that we have in Scripture. And, and one of the first things that we want to note is this parable is the third uh, of, of three parables as it moves uh, uh, along. And, and so in Luke 15, Jesus begins by talking about the shepherd. And this, there's a great song there about leaving the 99 to find the one. Okay, and so he kind of sets the, the, the tone of a theme here. He kind of puts together uh, an idea. And then he shares the parable of the widow that has ten coins and loses one and then finds it. And then he shares the story of the father who has two sons. And he goes after his one son. So imagine, if you would, the setting of this parable in Luke 15. Let's look at the first two verses here to set the context and remind ourselves of, of where we are. And, and um, interesting that we're here. Um, had a great opportunity this week. I want you to continue to pray about uh, what God is doing. But um, Steve and I went to the jail. We were in jail Thursday night. And so if you were in jail Thursday night, you had a great message there, I hope. And, and so we had a great time with the inmates there. And Landon invited us to come over and, and spend some time worshiping. And, and uh, so it was a great night. And this is where we were at. Uh, we were in actually Matthew, but uh, we were talking about uh, the tax collectors and sinners. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Okay? And, and so this is the context, okay? This is what you have to understand. You have to understand who Jesus is with, where he's at, who's gathered around him, who he's talking to, okay? And what's going on on the peripheral, what's going on out around him, uh, and who's watching this and what they're having to say about it. So, so, so this is the context. That's what's taking place. That's where they are. And now here's the parable that we want to drill down into. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 and 12 is where we're going to get started with that. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. Now, like I said, I've read this for years. I've preached this for years. I've talked about this, thought about this, but... But, but, but here's the thing, and, and a few years ago I spent some time watching a lecture series by Dr. Ken Bailey, and he was a professor of theology, spent 40 years teaching theology in Egypt, Lebanon, Palestine, and, and Israel, Cyprus, but he's, he's from over here in Bloomington, Illinois. And as I dug more into his teaching and, and, and what he had written on it, I began to discover even more power in this passage. And as an ag teacher and a pastor together, I have experienced this before, Okay. 
because a lot of the kids who've come, I, I get kids from every background that there is. And, and, and sometimes I get kids who come through that come from large farms. And, and, and just their family has, has acquired a lot of land and a lot of, a lot of things over the time. And, and so if, if you are a part of one of those families, if you're a part of something like this, this, this is going to hit a little different. Okay, this is going to settle in just a little bit different because of, of the background and what's taking place here. Okay? When, when we look at this scripture, when we look at this and says, Father, I want you to give me my share of the estate. Think about, feel, feel the weight of that, what that means. In a family farming operation that has, you know, we don't know how big this was, but in, in, in this context, if you want to really look at this context in Ohio County or in, in Kentucky or whatever, you take a family that farms a few thousand acres and they've got lots of equipment and it's a family operation and we have some of those. We have some in this room, okay? And, and, and in that situation, one of the, one of the, one of the kids, one of the, the, the brothers or sisters or whatever comes forward and says, Dad... I want my part. I want my part. I want you to... Uh, and so what does that mean? In, in today's context, it means one of two things. The first thing is it's going to have to be sold and, and given. Or it's going to have to be deeded. Or we're going to have to take out a huge equity loan on the value of what we have left. And we're going to give that money to this one sibling. And then they go on their merry way. Now, you guys are smart enough to understand if you have land or if you don't or if you just own a house. Okay, if you've just got, if you're just part of a family and mom and dad comes along and they're living and then all of a sudden it's like, hey, I want my part of the estate right now, even before. This is what he's saying. Okay, this is why this is so powerful. And this is where this kid was in his head. This is where he's at. And, and emotionally, this is where he's at. He's looking at his dad and saying, I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead. I would just, I just want, I want, if you were dead, I would sell, we would sell everything. I'd take my cash and I'll go party. That's what I want to do. So just kind of let that sink in a little bit because this is what's going on with this kid's life. This is what's happening here on this family farm in Israel. And, and this guy did it. He, he divided it up. This is unheard of, okay? It's hard to even fathom today. But, in, 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 but here's the thing. In first century culture... It was unacceptable. Because here's, here's how the Israel culture kind of, kind of, and some of you guys understand this. They, they didn't live on like we do. We have people that say, okay, well, this is the farmstead, and then we farm these farms around us. In, in, in Israel culture, they would farm multiple fields all around the countryside, but they all, for safety, they would all live in like a compound. Okay, and then there would be different families who would live in the compound. It's like a town, and so they would all live together in these little compounds for safety and security. And then during the day, they would go out to farm their farms, and they would come back together. So, so there were multiple family units who were living in this area, and so for this man to have to sell or or, or do whatever he had to do, he had to sell his property in order to give this son this inheritance, was just unheard of. You just don't do that. You just farm it and keep going. And so this, this was, this was going to cause a lot of uh, real difficulty within that community, within that family. And it, it was really going to be just hard to deal with. Live, live, they live together in this community. And, and so this is gonna, this, what it's going to do, it's going to cause grief. It's going to cause grief. And, and I've, I've seen that. I've seen that in, in, in my 32 years in education. I've seen uh, people that's like, you know, I wish somebody would stay and, and carry on this tradition. And then and they, they say, well, you know, I, I don't want to. I'm just going to leave. And then it's like, well, that's hard. Um, that's hard. And, and, and so there's a lot of grief in this situation because this young man has come forward and said, look, I want my money. I want my money. <laughs> Now, you're kind of feeling the incredible weight of that request, aren't you? You just kind of get a feel for just when he comes and says, look, I want this. And it's like, man. And so you understand that in order for this man to have, have, have his, his part of the estate, something had to be sold. Something had to be liquidated. Something had to... to uh, uh, be done so he can get it. And so in, in verse 13, we see that he gets it. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. And there he 
He squandered his wealth. Wild living. Blew it. Took the whole part of his father's estate and you can, put, you can figure out however you want to want to put piece that together. He went to Las Vegas and gambled it all away. He blew it all away. Whatever he did. But that's what he did. It's very, it's very simple. And then... After he had spent everything, times got tough. Okay? Times got tough. And he got hungry. He got hungry. There was a famine, and he began to be in need. So now, he needs a job. He needs a job. So he goes out, and he hires himself out to a citizen of the country that he's in, and he sent him out in his fields. And, and here's something that, if you've never noticed this before... <laughs> This is a story about a Jewish man. This is a story about Jesus' people. And so Jesus' people don't have pigs. Okay? We would be Gentiles. Okay? We would be Gentiles. Those of us who, who are pork people uh, are Gentile people. And so he is in a land that is foreign. He is not among Israelite people. He is not among Jewish people. He is in a foreign land. And so he gets a job feeding pigs. Now, I don't have to tell you, we have some pretty modern facilities right now. I mean, I've been in some amazing places. I've been to Fair Oaks up in, up in uh, uh, Illinois, and I've sat in uh, rooms that are carpeted uh, with central heat and air and office chairs and looked through big glass windows at pigs, okay? But if you open the door and walk out into the stalls where the pigs are, they still smell like pigs, all right? You can't get away from it. It doesn't matter what you do with them. You can wash them out. You can keep it clean. It looks nice. But it still smells. And so he is in, I can't imagine the, 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 what, what it has to be in this day and age, but he is in a field feeding pigs. It probably wasn't too bad because they were, they were spread out. And, and so he's out here working with them. And, and, and times are tough. And so when times are tough, people, they clean their plates. Okay? And so pigs eat anything. They're omnivores. They'll eat meat. They'll eat, they'll eat plants. It doesn't matter to them. And so you, you, a lot of people, and, and you guys, some of you all grew up like this too, the pig ate what you didn't, okay? The pig ate the potato peels. He ate whatever nobody wanted to eat. He ate the scraps, right? And, and so he's out here having to feed these pigs. And so when, when times are tough, food for the pigs get a little more difficult. You can't go to, uh, down to the feed store and get a sack of pig grower, okay? And that's not the way that works. And so it's a tough situation. So he gets a job. And he's hiring out to, to feed pigs. Verse 16 says, He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. Have you ever been hungry? Some of y'all call it hangry, right? Because you get really upset when you, don't, when you don't get to eat on time. Okay, Listen, in, 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 in this world, in this day... I dare to bet, unless you live through the depression, you probably have never been truly hungry. And, 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 and I realize that, that there are children in this community that, that do struggle with hunger. That breaks my heart. Uh, simply because they live in homes where the parents don't or aren't able or don't provide for them. And that, that breaks my And that's why we have an Ohio County food pantry. But, but, but when you're hungry, when you truly are hungry, and you guys have been hungry before... And when you're hungry and there's nothing available quickly to eat, or maybe you're, you're like me or you're teaching school or you're whatever and you, didn't, you skipped breakfast and all of a sudden you got two hours before you had the opportunity to eat and then you have to feel that way, well, you take that and you multiply that. And, and some of you have fasted. I've gone through uh, times of fasting and prayer. And, and so you, you have that, that feel of hunger. And, and so when, when you get to the point that you're hungry enough, that you're desiring what the pigs are eating, you're pretty hungry. Okay, I've seen a lot of pig pens and I've seen a lot of pig waste. Okay, I've seen a lot of what they don't eat. All right, and I've never in my life ever come to a place where I've looked in there and went, "Wish I could have some of that." Okay, never been there. He's there. That's where this cat's at. And I tell you what, it'll change you if you're in that condition. If you're in that place where you're that hungry, it'll make you think. As a matter of fact, what it did for him is he, he came to his senses. He came to his senses. We don't know for sure how old this kid is, but, but he's, he's pretty young. Young enough that he's making some real foolish decisions. 
Okay? Incredibly foolish decisions up to this point. Number one, he's broken up the family farm. Number two, he took it and blew it all. And now, he's come to his senses. But, but notice what he says here. This is, this is a real lesson. He says, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? I mean, Daddy's, dad's still farming. He takes care of his, his people that, that work for him better than this. Here I am starving to death. He says, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back home. I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and he went to his father. So he comes to his senses. He comes to his senses and, and, and he, <laughs> his question is this. This is where I want you to look at his, 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 his line of thinking. How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? You see, he's hungry. Hunger and pain are two very powerful motivators. Okay, If you're hungry or you're in pain, those two things will motivate you to make decisions. Okay, You're going to change the way you're living. If you start hurting or if you get hungry, then you're going to start making some changes in what's going on in your life, if you can, in order to achieve either pain-free living or food. And so hunger is his motivator. So when, when this happens, he acknowledges his sin. He comes to a place in the pig pen where he realizes, <sighs> messed up. This was all wrong. Then he comes up with a plan. Let's look at his plan. Let's, let's really think about this. In his mind, in the pig pen, he decides what he's going to do. I'll be like one of your hired hands. Okay? This is what he's doing. He's, he's, we see a repentant heart. Okay? We certainly see a repentant heart. But what he's doing in his mind is he is pairing repentance with work. And that's a mistake. He's pairing repentance with work. And, and so he's putting these two things together. He, he, he's, he, I'm going to be like one of your hired hands. So he pairs repentance with work. And he's, he's making now an attempt to earn forgiveness. I'm going to go back to dad and I'm going to say, hey, look, I'm sorry. I messed up. I, I'm, I'm really. And so you just can, you just hire me and I'll work for you. You hire me, I'll work for you, and I'll earn my way back in. I'll earn my way back in. There's three kinds of servants in this day and age, in this time. The first is a bond servant. Okay? The bond servant is somebody who lives in the community and listens to and obeys the master. The next is a lower class servant, and, and, and this, is, this is somebody that's kind of the step and fetch. Okay, uh, they're the go for servant for the bond servant. They're the one that, that runs the errands and does those things. And then the last type. Okay, so you got bond servant, and then and then you've got this next lower class servant, and then you've got a hired hand. Okay, one, two, three steps down. So he's on the lower end of this. A hired hand. This is like contract labor. They could be skilled labor. They what? But but the but the thing about the hired hand is these are independent contractors. It's important to understand where he's going here. I want to be a hired person. I want you to pay me. I, 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 I will work for my food. I will work for your honor. So you see what he's working out in his mind? You see how this is all working together? I know I've done wrong. So I'm just going to come and work for you. I'm just going to come and work for you. You see, th this, is, this is how we can, we, can, we can look at this. I'm coming home because I'm hungry. Okay, I'm coming home. I'm coming home because I'm hungry. <laughs> and I know I've done wrong. So I'll just work for you. And I'll live on my own. I, I, don't, I don't need your authority. And I don't need your grace. See where he's at? I don't need your authority. I don't need your grace. I'll, I'll handle this on my own. I'll work for you. I'll earn my own. Way. This is what he's done. 
He's figured out a way to keep his pride intact. He's figured out a way. This is, this is pig pen uh, resolutions, okay? He's in the pig pen. He's hungry. He's got to get some food. But he's figuring out how to keep his pride intact. But also do the right thing. This is the pig pen rehearsal, okay? This is the pig pen rehearsal for what he's wanting to do. He's rehearsed this whole thing and got this whole plan in the pig pen. And now he's got this figured out and he goes back, okay? So let's look at, at how this comes down. Luke 15 verse 20 says, He got up. And went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son. There's a powerful picture here. We'll look at it. And he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And and so he's rehearsed it in the pig pen. So there we go. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. You see, he's on, he's, on, he's on it, okay? I'm no longer to be worthy to be called your son. I, 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 I know what I'm going to do here. I've come back to work for you. I've come back to, to be one of your hired people. I'm going to be independent of you. I'm going to be... I'm, I'm, I... Notice that the father didn't communicate with him. <laughs> the father didn't respond to what he's saying here. Instead... The father says to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Oh, let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. Let's walk with the son just a few minutes on the road from the pig pen back to the edge of the city. What do you think's in his mind? We set the context here, right? He basically told his dad that he wished he was dead and and, and took the whole family farming operation and tore it to pieces and put his dad probably in a financial strain. And now he's coming back after he blew all that money. What do you think he's expecting? <laughs> what do you really think he's... I mean, he's starving, so he's got to do something. This is how he's going to get food. But what, do you, what kind of a reunion do you think this is in his mind is going to be? That the townspeople are all going to be now. The, the towns, everybody's going to be like, hey, he's back. Right? Hey, look, he's, he's come home. How, how awesome is that? We're so glad you came back, came to your senses after you blew the whole farm estate. No, he, he's expecting... Ridicule, he's expecting people looking at him down the nose. It's not going to be pretty. He took their wealth, okay? He took their wealth, and who did he give it to? The Gentiles, okay? There's another thing there. The, the casino owners are Gentiles, right? That's who got all the money. That's who got all the cash, and so that's who, that's who benefited from all of this. There's all kinds of problems here. This is what they would typically do. And, and this had to be in the back of his mind. When something like this could happen, there was a, there was a, um, a ceremony that was called a kazaa. And, and the kazaa, would, would, uh, they would perform this, and they would basically say, look, we're done with you. You're cut off. You're not welcome here. You blew it. It's gone. And we're finished. We are finished with you. And so in the, in the back of his mind, he had to be thinking, is that what they're going to do? There's not a lot of compassion in that. But when you've, when you've squandered all of the wealth of the family and forced a sale, it could happen. But instead... Look at how we see the father described. Filled with compassion. Who is always shown to be filled with compassion? Christ. Always. As they're driving nails in his hands and attaching his feet to a wooden cross to sacrifice him, to crucify him, he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. 
That's a father that is filled with compassion. While the nails are going in. Not later, but now, right now. That's the, kind of, that's the kind of compassion that he has for us. And so this father is filled with compassion for his son. The father ran to his son. Okay, listen, I usually don't run unless somebody's chasing me, okay? But in that, in that Middle Eastern culture, they wore the long robes. And so if you were going to run, you would have to gather that. So you didn't usually run unless something was chasing you. And so it would have to show your legs. And so that was all considered bad. And so men like this never ran. It was, a hum- uh, it, it was expressing of humility. It was expressing humbleness. So just the simple idea that he ran to his son was more than it was imagined. And here's the thing. All of the people all live together. They're all gathered together in these, this little compound. So they would have all seen it. All of his neighbors would have been just an arm's length away. What you have to realize is that this father would have been heartbroken. He's looking for his son. And what the text describes next is a community event. It, uh, I believe everybody came out. I believe everybody came out and, and, and followed the father. Because this is what happens. This community moment. And everyone comes and, and this is what happened. The father meets the son... And what we, what we experience is an unparalleled act of mercy and grace. It's an unparalleled act of mercy and, and, and grace. When this community comes together, when this father comes out and welcomes his son. And the things that he says, he says, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandal on, on his feet. And, and so this is what happens. In the mind of this son... It goes from, I want to be a hired servant. I want to be an independent contractor. I want to be free of you to, I want to be a son. I want to be a son again. I want to be a son. And his father welcomes him back. And we can see what Jesus was doing with the emphasis of the three parables. The shepherd searched for the sheep. The widow searched for the coin, and the father searched for the son. He says, get the best robe. Whose robe? It's the father's robe. That's the best robe. It was the father's ring. It was the signet ring. Now you have authority. We're going to kill the fattened calf, and so everybody can eat. It's a celebration. And then the older brother comes home. He's been away from town working. You can relate to this. Look at the context of it. He just stayed there and kept farming. This, this, this brother of his put him in all kinds of, no telling what kind of, of, of issues that he's had to work through. It says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him, what in the world is going on? Oh, your brother has come. What? Yeah, your brother's come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and he refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all of these years, all of these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you haven't even given me a young goat to celebrate with my friends. What in the world? You get it, don't you? You get it. You understand it. That's the way a lot of us would be, right? But when this son of yours, who's blown all your money with all your property, with prostitutes, comes home and you kill the fattened calf for him, what do you say? What do you say? Now, if you're gathered around Jesus, you're sitting at Jesus' feet, and you're hearing this, you're going to be blown away. Think about that. Somebody was. They were tax collectors and sinners sitting at the feet of Jesus, and they heard this. And they're blown away that the older brother could be rebellious. 
Now, we go back to the beginning of this text and, and notice what the father did. He, he, he divided the inheritance. This, this, this brother got his. He got his. The father divided the inheritance of the estate, and, and this brother got his. He refuses to go into the party. You've never done anything like this for me. Well, what's he acting like? I'll tell you what he's acting like. He's acting like a slave. He's acting like a slave who served his father out of duty. And he's trying to earn the acceptance of his dad through work. Now we see it in both sons. Outwardly, he looks like he's got it all together. He's the one who stayed and kept the farm. He's the one who stayed and kept it all going. He's the one who kept the things moving in the right direction. He's not the one who took all the money and blew it. But his heart's wrong. You see, he has a performance-based approach for earning the favor of his father. And it's preventing him from experiencing his dad's love. His performance-based approach to getting love is, is, is taking away his ability to experience the love of his dad. There's a lot of folks who've worked in church so long that they're worn out. They've worked in church so long that I've been, I've been doing this for, for 25 years, I know. I've heard the stories. I've talked to them. This is what wears you out. This is what wears you out. It's like being a Pharisee. You get exhausted from riding on a legalistic treadmill because you're constantly looking at the world out there and you're like, I'm in here doing this stuff. I'm doing, I'm doing what I'm supposed to. And they're out there living like crazy. And See? Aren't you glad we don't have to earn it? <laughs> oh, I am so glad we don't have to earn it. I am so glad we don't have to earn it. But we live like we do sometimes. It was a humiliating act to leave the celebration and go to the other son. The father goes to him too. My son... The father said, verse 31, you're always with me. You're always with me. <laughs> Everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours is dead. He's alive again. He's lost. He's found. The older brother had two choices. He can repent come to the celebration or he can reject Jesus ends this parable in an amazing way what happened we don't know we don't know he doesn't tell us he doesn't tell us why what are you going to do what are you going to do with the invitation to the celebration? What's the point of the parable? The unwarranted, undeserved, unmerited, unconditional love of God is extended to sinners like us. It's extended to sinners like us. He knows how many times that we've rejected Him. He knows exactly how many times we've turned our back on Him. But He still says, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Here's the keys to the kingdom. You're not second-class citizens. You're co-heirs with Christ. You're co-heirs with Christ. You see it? The parable started with, Dad, I want you dead. You see it? And the father was repeatedly humiliated. You see it? Don't miss it. They were spared condemnation by the Father. He was pierced for our transgressions. 
pastor storyteller. He knew exactly what was coming. He was explaining it to those sinners and tax collectors who were sitting at his feet. He was the father. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed by our sins. By his wounds, we are healed. Listen, you may be here this morning. You may feel like a prodigal. You may feel like you're in the need of the love of the father. Or maybe you're here and you feel like the older brother. And you're just checking the boxes. And you're here. And you're worn out. Welcome to the celebration. Welcome to the celebration. Let me invite you to celebrate today with the family of God. Right. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you so much. Father, that through your word that you reveal to us the love that you have for us. Father, what an amazing story, Father, that we've read so many times. And I pray this morning that we've seen it with different eyes. I, I, I pray that we've heard it with different hearts. Father, you know where each one is this morning. Maybe there's someone here, Lord, that uh, needs to come back. Maybe there's, here, there's someone here this morning that has come to their senses. They've come this morning hungry, and they just need to come home. Father, we welcome them with, with open arms. You're, you stand, Father, at, 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 and, and, and with your arms spread wide. Father, maybe some of us are here just dog-tired. We've been running the same old race, and we've been doing the same old things over and over again, and we need, a, we need a fresh start. We need a fresh beginning. We need to be welcomed back into the celebration. We don't work because we have to. We work because we want to, to celebrate you. Lord, you know where we are. Father, help us to make the decision on how we need to reflect, respond to this message. Lord, we pray it. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. Thank you.